Hi there, my name's James Ross, I'm a barber of eight years and studying to become a dermal clinician here in Melbourne, Australia. Now in today's episode, I'm going to be going through something that I've definitely experienced, I know probably most of you have, or at least seen it in one of our clients, dandruff. We've seen it when foiling our clients, we've seen it when we're doing skin fades, and it comes in all shapes and forms. So in today's episode, I'm going to be going through what it is, how it occurs, and how we can at least treat it or at least manage it in some cases. When a client is sitting in a chair, we have most definitely seen dandruff, from fine little white bits of dust that I like to call snow, to absolute chunks of skin that seem to fall off. In my world, this is what we call seborrheic dermatitis. This condition affects areas where our pseudoriferous glands are present. As discussed in the last episode, these are present all over our body, but most abundant on our face and scalp. Dandruff falls under the category of seborrheic dermatitis. It is only confined to the areas of the scalp and sometimes on the eyebrows and facial hair. So what is seborrheic dermatitis and how does it occur? Now you may or may not know, but covering our skin is a film of microorganisms. This is referred to as the microbiota or the skin microbiome. The film contains things such as bacteria and fungi. Each of these microorganisms have different roles and functions, first being commensal. This means that they reside on our skin, benefit from the environment, but we don't necessarily benefit from their presence. On the other hand, we have symbionts, which have a mutualistic benefit to us as they assist in preventing pathogenic microorganisms from colonizing by defending themselves via secreting substances, competing for nutrients, and also stimulating our skin's immune response, which is where seborrheic dermatitis comes into play. A specific yeast called Malassezia is present on our skin. Malassezia has several species underneath it, and the one specific to dandruff is Malassezia globosa. This yeast is lipophilic, meaning it loves to consume sebum, which is present on our hair and skin. Once this microorganism has done so, it leaves a byproduct called oleic acid. This particular acid has the potential to cause irritancy on the skin. This signals the body's inflammatory immune response, and in doing so, induces an influx of keratinocyte differentiation to help remove that oleic acid. In essence, the body is producing more skin cells to help shed those top layers of the stratum corneum and help rid the byproduct that is produced by Malassezia globosa. Alongside this, other factors come into play, such things as poor hygiene, resulting in a buildup of sebum and therefore a playground for Malassezia, dry slash sensitive skin, influenced by things as medication, humidity, diet and stress, and other health conditions that relate to the skin of the face and the scalp. Seborrheic dermatitis can be seen in infants all the way through to adulthood. In infants, we call this cradle cap, and is a subtype of infantile seborrheic dermatitis. This is a chronic, non-inflammatory condition and is self-limiting, meaning it usually resolves on its own. This is usually seen in the first few months of birth and looks quite greasy, with yellow plaques as seen here on the scalp. Unfortunately, this can be quite embarrassing for parents due to its unsightliness and can sometimes even have an odour. This condition though is asymptomatic, meaning that there's no real itch or pain to the infant and doesn't affect their ability to feed or sleep. Why this condition occurs isn't quite known. Some have hypothesized once the child is born, an influx of hormones and a change from environment influences epidermal activity and upregulates sebum secretion. Even though cradle cap is self-limiting, there are a few things we can do to help remove the plaque in the time being. First, Bathe the infant as normal and use an emollient such as sorbeline cream, mineral or baby oil to help soften the plaque and remove with a soft brush or comb. If the condition progresses beyond measures or for a prolonged amount of time, advise your client to see their family GP for advice, which may involve medicated topicals. Moving on to adulthood, we know that sebum production amps up around puberty and adolescence. Specific androgens or sex hormones are activated and specifically that testosterone. Testosterone directly controls the sebum production across our bodies, and this is also why we see acne in teens and adulthood, and once we reach a certain age, our skin becomes compromised due to the downregulation of testosterone. However, even though sebum is being activated, this doesn't necessarily mean we'll get seborrheic dermatitis, it's more so just a correlated factor between the two. When this condition becomes adverse, we will definitely see an exacerbated immune response, with the scalp becoming visibly irritated, red and itchy, due to the buildup of sebum and keratinocytes, kind of like resembling that of cradle cap, and various other forms of dermatitis. Yellow plaques begin to form, including the area, which gives microorganisms a place to thrive. How can we alleviate this cycle and help bring our clients back to a sense of control or normality? 
Now remember, there are numerous factors that contribute to this condition and some things we just cannot advise on, such as diet or other medical conditions. However, as hairdressers and barbers, we can guide them in a way of giving back control, such as avoiding things such as hot showers, which dry out the skin, air conditioners, which dry out the air, and also the use of shampoos and treatments and how often they should be using these. You'd be quite surprised how often or how little some people shampoo. Do remember the approach that we take depends on things such as their age and severity of the condition. If your client is showing signs of chronic severoid dermatitis, a simple clarifying shampoo isn't going to help at all. Advise them to see their GP for treatment, which may involve things such as antifungal creams, anti-inflammatory medications, etc. In mild forms of dandruff, we may have specific anti-dandruff shampoos or treatments in the various lines we carry in our salons and barbershops. Do remember though that we need to sort out the underlying cause of this condition and by doing so we have to look out for ingredients such as zinc pyrithion, ketocanazole, cyclopyrox, selenium sulfide, coal tar and salicylic acid. These ingredients are proven to help treat oleic acid as well as aid in the breakdown and removal of excessive keratinocyte buildup on the scalp. These ingredients can be found in over-the-counter products such as Head & Shoulders, Nizarol and Cetol at places such as the pharmacy. However, I'm sure many of you are aware that these products aren't necessarily nice for the hair, which is correct. We need to educate our clients that these products need to be applied and focused directly onto the scalp and not the ends of our hair. It may seem tedious to have possibly two shampoos going in the shower, but from personal experience, it's a lot easier to deal with it than have to deal with the discomfort it brings every single day. All in all, seborrheic dermatitis can be quite easy to deal with when treated appropriately. I do believe we need to talk more with our clients about their scalp conditions, especially when it's something that's quite embarrassing to bring up. So gently talk to them about the situation, chat to them about their options, but never be disrespectful or forceful. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening in today, you lovers of hair and skin. Don't forget to comment if you have any questions and like and subscribe for the release of future episodes in the coming weeks.